So I hope you can hear me. Um, it's a great pleasure, and I'm very happy to to have the opportunity to introduce Paul Sharp, who's a great friend and, and also a colleague. Um, but Paul received his PhD in economics from from the University of Copenhagen in, in 2009. Uh, during his PhD, he obtained a, a medical fellowship in the Department of History and uh, Civilization at the UI in Florence. Then afterwards, he's been assistant professor at the Humboldt University in Berlin and postdoc at the University of Copenhagen. And since uh, 2014, Paul is professor of economics at the University of uh, Southern Denmark. As I said, Paul is a great economic historian and he's working mainly on agricultural history and, and the economic history of, of, uh, of Denmark. Um, he has published extensively and intensively, I would say, in, in top field journals, uh, in the field of economic history, growth, development. He's also published in general interest journals, like the Economic Journal. And like uh, all the good economic historians, he's also published books and uh, most recent one, Land of Milk and, and Butter for, for the University of, of Chicago Press. Um, Paul is a member also of important networks. He's a Cage Research Associate of Warwick and the CPR Research Fellow of London. Since uh, 2014, he has also been an elected member of the Danish Society for Agricultural History. He's been chair of the Danish Society for Economic and Social History. And since 2018, he's president of the Scandinavian Society for Economic and Social History. Um, he has worked in many editorial boards and currently is the chief editor of the Scandinavian Economic History Review. Um, just to conclude saying that he has also received many prestigious grants and including the Sapere Aude grant for a project titled Rethinking the Economic Takeoff of Denmark, which I believe will be, will be part of, of his talk today. So I'm really looking forward to um, your presentation and the floor is yours. Thank you, Francesco. It's, uh, that was a very nice introduction. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have this opportunity to present for everyone. It was also a great pleasure to be um, kind of initiated into DS uh, relatively recently. This is a title which I, I kind of suggested uh, some time ago, uh, and uh, then it was delayed because of COVID and so on. And uh, when I started preparing this, I thought, my God, I was had kind of very grandiose thoughts about what I was going to talk about. Uh, so we'll see how uh, how far I get with that. So I called it Denmark and the Renaissance of Economic History. And so I thought I would uh, illustrate this with a map of Denmark or Denmark, Norway, as it was then during the Renaissance, even though that's not really what I'm going to be talking about, as you'll see. So a quick overview of what I'm going to try to cover. I kind of maybe put too much as usual into my presentation here. Uh, so I will start by talking about what I call the international renaissance of economic history. And then I will explain what economic history is, at least according to myself. Then I will talk about the Danish renaissance. And then I'll get more into my own uh, research. So particularly, how did Denmark get to Denmark? So how did Denmark become the, the sort of country it is today? Uh, in order to understand that, we have to understand what Denmark actually was back in the 1700s, which is where most of what I work on uh, starts, where it starts. And then I will tell you some, some of what I have learned about Danish economic history uh, so far, and I'll end with a little about what I think the future might hold, although I think uh, economists, like everyone else, are notoriously bad at predicting the future, so uh, we'll see. <laughs> see whether these things come, come to pass, but some of it is about what I am planning to work on myself. So just starting with the international renaissance of economic history. So, and this kind of leads into uh, my idea about what economic history actually is, or what's not just my idea, but what people in general say it is. So I think we can kind of date this, I mean, economic history has been around for a long time, but we can kind of date this to uh, the mid 1960s, particularly in the, 19, in, in the United States with something which has become known as the Cliometric Revolution. So Clio, as you might know, was the Greek muse of history. And if you put something in front of metrics, it basically means that you're using uh, econometric or economic methods to look at that particular topic. So this was basically the idea of using uh, economic theory and quantitative methods from economics in order to explain uh, history. And this was awarded uh, by the Nobel Prize Committee in 1993 uh, when North and Fogel give the Nobel Prize for having 
basically worked on just this, this idea. And this basically led to a situation where a lot of modern economic history uh, is essentially applied econometrics. So this is not to say that people are not working on economic history within history departments and so on, of course they are, but a lot of the sort of background which I have in economic history is within this sort of applied econometrics tradition. It wasn't the case, however, that as soon as the Nobel Prize was awarded to economic history, that uh, economic history really took off. And in fact, during a lot of the 90s and the, uh, and the 2000s, uh, if you went to an economic history conference, you would have these rather, in my view, sort of depressing sessions about what the future of economic history uh, was going to be. And I think when you're uh, having sessions with, or kind of roundtables about this sort of thing, this often implies that, uh, well, maybe you don't believe there is going to be a future. And thankfully, these sort of things have, have died down in recent times. And I think most people would date the kind of the big takeoff of economic history in recent times to the financial crisis in uh, 2007, 2008. This was, of course, was, of course, a very bad thing for many people, but it turned out to be a rather good thing for economic historians. And I think this is probably to do with, with the fact that it meant that economists started to doubt themselves. So I think a lot of economists, a lot of macroeconomists in particular, had an idea that, well, we kind of know what we need to do. We just have to have independent central banks and inflation targeting, this sort of stuff, and the rest of the economy to take care of itself. And then suddenly things went wrong, and we started rethinking uh, what we actually knew. And in this sort of setting, economic history really presents a lot of possibilities. And this, this seems to be when economic history began entering the sort of more mainstream of economics. And I was kind of lucky in a sense, because uh, I was given my PhD in 2009, very shortly after this. So I was kind of ideally placed uh, to, uh, to kind of experience this takeoff of economic history from around about that time. And I should say in this connection that I, have a, I owe a particular debt of gratitude to uh, my former PhD supervisor who sadly passed away a few years ago, uh, Carl Gunnar Pearson. And then particularly uh, in terms of my work on Danish economic history to Ingrid Henriksen, who is now emeritus. A professor at FSDU, uh, who really inspired us my work to do with, with Denmark. So there's kind of a, a sort of international perspective uh, in terms of my work that economic history was gaining ground at this time, but also that I had some, some really great uh, colleagues and inspiration uh, back when I was at the University of Copenhagen, where I did my PhD, as Francesco said. So you might be wondering, what is economic history? So I can give you a kind of boring definition and an interesting definition. So what I call the boring definition is that it's basically what I said before, using the methods from economics to understand history. But then I would say there's a more interesting definition or maybe more of a sort of motivation, which is very important for myself, which is really about understanding why some countries are poor and other countries are rich. So we know there's a huge amount of inequality in the world today. Uh, some countries like Denmark are incredibly rich, other countries in much of the developing world are, are very poor and haven't really grown in economic terms uh, for, for ever, basically. And uh, when you think about this a bit, you would, you would realize that, of course, if we go far back enough in time, well, then we were all uh, sort of primitive hunter-gatherer societies. At some point, we had the emergence of agriculture, we were poor farmers, uh, but it's only in relatively recent times that certain countries started to take off and to become rich. And so if we want to understand why we have this inequality in the world today, we really have to go back in time and understand why certain countries are historically unusual in the sense that they enjoy such high standards of living as they do today. So for my research, which isn't exclusively about Denmark, but a lot of it is, so a lot of my inspiration is really in terms of trying to understand how Denmark became the rich and successful country it is today. But I should also mention that other economic historians are, are motivated uh, by more specific uh, things. For example, uh, what can we learn uh, for, the, uh, for financial crises from the Great Depression of the 1930s? Or especially these days, of course, a lot of people have been saying, well, we can maybe learn things from the experience of the Spanish flu a, cent a century ago uh, for how we can deal with uh, COVID-19. So there's a bunch of different reasons why people get into economic history. So, what is the status of economic history today? As I said, I think there's been something of a renaissance. It's been uh, really entering the economics mainstream recently. I think it's important to say in this context that as probably, and here I'm of course speaking to uh, an interdisciplinary audience, uh, it's important to say that 
you know, we know that economics often gets a bad press. You can read a lot about this uh, in, uh, in various newspapers and magazines and so on. But I would say that this is often based on a rather outdated idea of what economists do. Uh, so I think if you went back uh, a couple of decades or so, it would maybe would be true that a lot of the, uh, the big economists were working on very complex mathematical models and so on. But really, if you look at the main economics journals these days, you would see that a lot of what is going on is really very strongly quantitative. So economists want data, and as computer power has increased, it's been possible to process more and more data. And this, of course, has meant economic history has become very attractive because it's a great source of really large data sets which we can use to analyze things. This leads into another debate, which is about quantitative methods. So quantitative methods are sometimes uh, criticized by some people, especially perhaps from uh, some people in humanities and other social sciences. But I would say, well, you know, there are limitations to these quantitative methods which economists use. But if we just look at the corona crisis today, for example, I think we can all agree that we wouldn't really be getting very far if we didn't have any good data to analyze what's going on. And this can be extended to any field of science, basically. We need data in order to understand what's going on. And so data also plays an important part in terms of understanding economic history. What you can see in amongst modern economic historians is that they're exploiting more and more advanced methods, basically, as computing power has, has increased. So apart from the advanced econometric methods, you have uh, things like GIS, which is basically a way of making maps. You have machine learning. You have lots of other things. It's becoming more and more technical. My only worry in this context is that as economic history becomes more mainstream, and what I mean by mainstream is basically becoming more, more and more a part of economics, is that we will start to forget uh, the important contributions from the humanities. And here I mean particularly historical methods, archival work, which I greatly enjoy myself. I don't have so much time for it these days, but I, I really enjoy this. Uh, source criticism, all this sort of thing. I think this is really where economic historians have to stand up and say, this is a really fundamental and important part of economic history as well, but very strongly complementary to the, uh, to the quantitative work which modern economic historians are doing. I put here a nice graph, which I found that a very uh, famous economic historian called Bob Margo uh, put together some time ago about the sort of convergence of economic history uh, with mainstream economics. So basically this graph shows a couple of economic history journals, the Journal of Economic History and Explorations in Economic History, and how the proportion of, of articles in these, uh, in these journals, which are using econometrics terms, has converged with mainstream uh, economics journals, general interest journals, labor, uh, labor economics journals, and this, and this type of thing. As economic history has kind of converged with, economic, with economics, we can also see that uh, the impact factors of economic history journals have been increasing. And this is just a graph that I found somewhere on, on the internet, uh, showing uh, one way of measuring the impact factor for what is often considered to be the leading field journal in economic history. And if you're in natural science or medicine, you will laugh at these impact factors. I'm quite aware of that. Uh, we're not as ambitious, I think, in, in economics. But this is a, a pretty nice development. And you can really see this cutoff around about the time of the financial crisis, which I think is interesting. And as Francesca mentioned, I'm involved in editing uh, a rather less prestigious uh, journal called the Scandinavian Economic History Review. And you can see this even happening in these minor economic history journals as well. So there's really something which has meant that these journals have started to be cited a lot more uh, than they were in the past. Of course, you need to compare that with something else. Here is a, another very strong uh, macro journal. You can see it a, has a, an impact factor which is somewhat higher, but it's rather stable uh, over time. And if we look at a journal which was really one of the top journals uh, not so long ago, uh, the Journal of Economic Theory, which is much more to do with uh, sort of uh, mathematical modeling and this sort of thing, you can see, if anything, the impact of this journal has fallen over time. So really, you see that economic history and these quantitative methods has really taken off uh, recently and is, in, and is indeed uh, reflected by these uh, impact factors. So turning to the Danish Renaissance of economic history, I should, of course, mention that there are many great economic historians who came before uh, any of us who are around uh, today. I'm not going to mention all of them, uh, but there are plenty of them. And of course, there are plenty of great scholars working on history and economics uh, around Denmark uh, at this present time as well. 
There is also, I should mention, a little plug for my own research group. There's quite a large group of, of economic historians at SDU called the Historical Economics and Development Group. And this has been greatly assisted by support from DS. So Francesco was partly funded by, uh, by money from DS and uh, Keith Myers was another one. So we've had people supported by uh, DS funding and by other sources of internal and external funding, uh, which has meant that we've, we've been able to grow this rather large group of economic historians at SDU and uh, participate in this renaissance of economic history in recent years. It should be mentioned, however, that not all of the work done at Hedge, so at the Historical Economics and Development Group at SDU, is on Danish economic history. And in fact, most of the, the members do not work on Danish economic history. But my focus is on Denmark, and as Francesca said, particularly on agriculture, but not exclusively. I've worked on a bunch of other topics as well. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I've learned so far. So this is going to be like a roller coaster ride through, uh, through my recent uh, years of, of publishing. Uh, and I should say in this connection that I will not be able to acknowledge everyone who has supported me in this. This is together with all sorts of really great co-authors that uh, you are extremely appreciated, uh, but I cannot possibly mention all of you in the limited time I have to present here, sadly. Okay, so let's step back a little bit. So I talked about my inspiration for understanding uh, Danish economic history. And if we think about it in terms of this, uh, you know, how do some countries uh, become rich and why do other countries stay poor? Well, Denmark is a rather interesting case. Denmark is, of course, one of the richest countries in the world, but it also embodies all sorts of other things which are also considered to be very uh, positive. This is not to say that there are not problems in Denmark. Of course, there are, as in many other countries. But in many of these sort of indices that are put together by various organizations and so on, Denmark often excels in things like social mobility, personal freedom, happiness, we all know about this one, uh, sustainability, and uh, gender equality, and this sort of thing. So there's all sorts of reasons to think that Denmark might be an interesting uh, case to look at. So then, of course, I want to answer how did Denmark get there? And this reminds me a bit of what is kind of an internal joke amongst economists. So, you know, of course, the best paid economists are asked to predict exchange rates and share prices and that sort of thing. And we always say, well, if we actually could do that, we probably wouldn't be working in academia. We would uh, cash in on that, uh, become very rich and, uh, and not be here anymore. And it's a bit like that when you're asking, why did a country like Denmark get rich? You know, if we really knew that, if we knew what made countries rich, we knew everything about that, well, then uh, we would probably be, do be doing something else. And in fact, all countries in the world presumably would then be able to benefit from that and everyone in the world would be rich. So the short answer is we don't really know everything yet, but we of course are contributing to an understanding of this, of this process over time. There is this famous quote from Francis Fukuyama about getting to Denmark and how this can be a goal for developing countries. So the idea being that uh, you know, there's Denmark, sort of, sort of mythological Denmark somehow embodies lots of goals which you would want to see uh, in a developing country in order to see these countries uh, develop. Today, we might think about these things I mentioned before, things like equality, trust in institutions, freedom, high levels of education, these sort of things. And I think in more general terms, we can say, well, if people want to get better off, then it's important to be able to afford things like healthcare and education, and this sort of thing. And so a first step to understanding all of this is to understand how did Denmark get rich and become able to afford these sort of things. My work and the way I try to understand this is mostly by going back to the 1700s with a particular focus on agriculture. And as the, uh, the article on the right hand side of the slide shows, uh, agriculture is still a big deal for Denmark today. Uh, this is an article from The Economist about tiny Denmark being an ag agricultural superpower. And this is not something new. So agriculture has been a big part of Danish success for a long time. I should mention that my knowledge about uh, pretty much everything becomes very fuzzy after the First World War, uh, but this is something I've been working on uh, in recent times, so uh, you have to bear with me on that. So in order to understand what we're talking about, we also have to understand what we mean by Denmark. So what was Denmark in the 1700s? Well, first of all, it was geographically very different. So Denmark was in union with Norway, of course, uh, it also, uh, the King of Denmark was also the Duke of uh, Schleswig and Holstein in present day Germany. Uh, there were colonies in Greenland, Iceland, the Faroe Islands and various uh, trading colonies around the world. Uh, so this was kind of the geographical extent of the Danish monarchy at the time. 
But one thing which I think a lot of people don't really uh, appreciate about historical times is, is the identity question. And this is something which I've been become very interested in recent times and have read some nice identity histories by historians about this. And this really important point, which is that most people living in present day Denmark back in the 1700s would not have associated themselves particularly with Denmark. So the Latin term patria, which is often uh, translated into fatherland, was something which only became associated with the nation state from at the earliest around about the end of the 1700s. Before that, patria, the concept, meant an identity in terms of your local, uh, your local community, so your, a place where you, where you were born, basically. This starts to change in the late 1700s as Denmark tries to sort of differentiate itself from Germany in particular. Germans are very important in terms of running the country at the time. And one of the kind of big signs of this is, is what I put on the right hand side of the, of the slide, which was when uh, a law was passed which allowed Denmark uh, or people from outside Denmark to register as people with the same rights as people who were born in Denmark. This is actually the first case of a sort of naturalization law uh, being introduced anywhere in the world, re reflecting the importance of the creation of national identity in Denmark. In institutional terms, Denmark in the 1700s was, of course, also very different. You had serfdom, an absolute monarchy. Here is Frederick III, the first uh, absolute monarch from the 1660s, uh, being appointed by God. And if you've been to the central station in Copenhagen, you will, might have noticed that there is a monument outside. This is the monument to the end of serfdom uh, in the late 1700s. Uh, serfdom uh, being a system whereby uh, people were not allowed to move away from the land of their landowners, had to work for the landowner and this sort of thing. So very restrictive and what we would consider today very backwards institutions in the 1700s. In economic terms, Denmark in the 1700s was characterized by environmental and economic collapse. So on the, in the graph, you can see uh, wages adjusted for the cost of living in various different cities. And you can see Denmark in the 1700s was one of the poorest, or Copenhagen was one of the poorest cities in Europe. Uh, based on the data that we have. And in fact, Denmark was also suffering an environmental collapse at the time. This is something we associate maybe with today, but it was also the case in Denmark in the 1700s, largely because Denmark was so involved in fighting lots of wars against the Swedes, uh, was cutting down all the trees in order to buy build boats to fight the Swedes. Uh, and this led to a deterioration of the soil, the uh, growing uh, various problems with uh, sand dunes and so on in Jutland. Uh, leaving, leading uh, cattle, susceptible to cattle plague and, and this type of thing. So the usual story about how Denmark got itself out of this hole is often focused on the late part of the 1800s. And this graph here shows the uh, exports of a couple of important uh, agricultural products from Denmark, which you can see really take off at the end of the 1800s. This is often associated with the use of a new technology, a steam power technology called the automatic cream uh, separator, which was a centrifuge, which could much more efficiently separate cream uh, from butter, uh, from milk to, in order to create butter. And basically the peasants got together, they founded cooperative creamers and, uh, and therefore could, to, could implement this technology and centralized production. And this led to big improvements in both quality and quantity of their production. A lot of this was then exported to the United Kingdom. But when uh, I started looking at this, there was something a little bit wrong with this story. And these maps kind of illustrate this quite nicely. <clears throat> so basically, the first one of these cooperative creameries was founded in a place called Yelling in the southwest of Jutland and by, in 1882. And the following year, you have a little kind of Silicon Valley of these cooperative creameries forming in this part of, of Denmark. If you just go uh, a couple of years after the founding of the first one of these cooperatives, you can see them popping up all over Denmark. And then as you move through the 1880s, the country rapidly fills up so that by the time you get to 1890, pretty much the whole country is full of these little butter factories. This is an extraordinarily rapid industrialization of agriculture in Denmark. In fact, if you go up to the First World War, you can see, you know, even the smallest little islands in Denmark will have one or two of these butter factories. And so Marcus Lamper, who is a really great co-author of mine uh, now in Vienna, and I looked at this question uh, 10 years ago, uh, 10 years or so ago, and thought, well, what's going on here? How can this be possible? And basically, uh, this ended up with a, a whole series of uh, articles and uh, with a book, 
uh, which in which we try to explain that this was based on a much much longer run process where a lot of things come together which allow Denmark to uh, industrialize its agriculture very rapidly from the end of the 1800s. This is uh, all to do with certain elite groups who were in the Duchess of Schleswig and Holstein, which as I said, up until 1864 were under the Dane King, uh, deciding to move into Denmark and introducing a new centralized uh, form of creamery, uh, which is basically what later provides inspiration uh, to the peasants in the late 1800s. But this is happening in the 1700s. And we see it as a direct result of Denmark losing lots of wars to Sweden. The crown goes bankrupt, needs to raise money, privatize a lot of, privatizes a lot of land. And these big traditional elite landowners see an opportunity, buy up land in Denmark and introduce uh, this more sort of modern way of uh, producing dairy products of that time. The problem was that outside the estates of the elites, uh, this was not possible for the normal peasant farmers, partly because of institutional reasons, but also because of technological reasons. So basically, uh, the problem was that you couldn't transport milk over longer distances in the past because it would become homogenized as it went over bumpy country roads, which made it very difficult to centralize a uh, peasant production. But when this new automatic cream separator comes in, that doesn't matter anymore. And so it means that suddenly the peasantry is able to benefit from basically a century of innovation which has gone on amongst these elites who had invested in all sorts of educational establishments, scientific societies, uh, academic journals, uh, all sorts of other things. And this is what we think laid the basis for this rapid takeoff of Denmark in the late 1800s. And we can show that econometrically and also in terms of maps, we can graph where these elites were setting up these new, uh, this new type of agriculture in the 1780s. And we find a strong correlation with where these uh, cooperative creameries emerge a century or so later. This has some important policy implications because when you look at Denmark uh, from a development perspective, it's often been considered that, well, what Denmark did right was forming cooperatives for its farmers. But we're saying, well, it wasn't so much the cooperatives, which was a big part of the story. It was more the education, it was more the science, all these sort of things which were going on a century prior to the founding of the first cooperative. And this is an important policy implication because it means that various attempts to develop uh, countries' agriculture in developing countries by creating cooperatives, for example, as was tried in Ireland in the 19th century, in the early 20th century, or as was tried in India after the Second World War, didn't work, basically, and we think that's probably because the impact of these cooperatives was, was somewhat overstated. I mean, they, might, they were certainly important, but there was a lot more behind it, which was also important. When we look at this story about how Denmark uh, kind of succeeded through this innovation from the elites leading to kind of spreading down to the peasantry, we shouldn't forget that various people lost in this process as well. Of course, serfs lost under serfdom. Uh, we also see the emergence of a class of landless uh, peasants. And we see uh, women being uh, crowded out of dairy production. It was traditionally something which women did as it became more industrialized. There was a kind of an idea that women couldn't possibly work in this sort of scientific type thing. So they were gradually squeezed out of, out of dairy agriculture. This is just a graph from a project together with, uh, with Peter Sandholt Jensen and some others, uh, which shows the difference in standards of living uh, measured by real wages between Scania, which is the southern part of Sweden, which was recently lost to Sweden in the 1700s, and uh, wages in Denmark. And you can see that the wages over the 1700s are increasing in this former part of, of Denmark. In the area where serfdom is implemented, it's very stagnant, which shows the kind of impact on living standards uh, from, uh, from serfdom. Then I'll quickly go through some of my more recent research in the last few minutes or so, where I've been concentrating a little bit more about on what happened to the losers. So it turns out that this uh, can be dated back to the last ice age or what is technically called the last glaciation in a funny sort of way. So basically the soil quality in Denmark was determined during the last ice age. Certain parts of Denmark were covered by glaciers. Uh, as these moved away from Denmark, they took away the topsoil and made these parts of Denmark relatively infertile. So the map on the right shows the areas, the darker areas are basically the more fertile parts of Denmark with a particular type of, of clay. And on the left hand, hand side, you can see a measure uh, from uh, historical times of the, uh, the soil quality in various parts of Denmark. You see there's a very strong correlation between these, these two things. What we discovered in some recent work is that 
the, uh, this had an impact on land inequality after a period of agricultural reforms, which went on from the late 1700s to the early 1800s. So basically these agricultural reforms, which also included serfdom, for example, meant that it was possible to exploit the land better than you could before. And certain parts of the land which were more fertile, you could exploit even better. And what we observed was that the areas where you have greater land inequality uh, after the agrarian reforms, these are the areas which are the higher level of uh, soil quality. Why was that? Well, we see it's from population increase. So we have nice uh, census data from Denmark for historical times. We can see that these areas uh, saw a higher rate of population increase, leading to this class of people who had access to very little land or no land at all. Then you might say, well, what happened to these losers from this process then? So there were winners, the people who ended up forming the cooperatives and so on, and the big landowners. But these landless people, what happened to them? We can then show in other work, very recent work, that these areas where you had more land inequality were the areas where you saw most people deciding to leave to go to America during the era of mass uh, migration uh, in the late 1800s. Then you might ask, well, where did they go? So this is a map of the United States in 1880, and the darker areas are where Danes went. In the Midwest, you have rather dark colors. This is where a lot of Scandinavians in general went. And what did they do there? Well, they did dairying as well. And this is kind of the funny thing about how research works. As you kind of go more and more into depth with a certain topic, you get inspired to work on other topics, which you can show how they link together uh, in, in sometimes quite unusual ways. So we can see this whole sort of process which started with, with these agricultural reforms, uh, led to these people leaving, they went to America, they then subsequently transferred knowledge about advanced dairying to the United States. And we can see a very strong uh, correlation between where Danish communities were in the US and where modern dairying was introduced. So we can also show the impact of this industrialization of agriculture in other countries, uh, including the United States. So that was just a bit on my own research. And in the last couple of slides, I will just tell you a couple of other things I thought you might uh, find interesting uh, to see. So uh, you might think, well, where do we find Danish history in today's Denmark? So a lot of my work is about finding limits in traditional national narratives, as I just gave you a brief introduction to, or finding extra aspects to the national narratives in terms of history, which other people haven't thought of before, which we can use quantitative methods to exploit and try to understand. But in fact, of course, a lot of aspects of Danish culture have historical roots. So I live in Fredericksburg. If I walk around Fredericksburg or Copenhagen or when I'm walking around Odense, I recognize a lot of the people in the street names because a lot of them are named after these agricultural elites and other great agricultural scientists who I've written about. So there's a very kind of immediate connection. So in Fredericksburg, you had this big agricultural university uh, founded. So really a lot of the street names around where I live are named after these, uh, these scientists from former times. And then you can also see all sorts of other parts of Danish society which measure its history. And here you can see a connection to more like cultural history, which I also find uh, really, uh, really fascinating. So if you look at the type of food that people eat, things like cold school, the big feta cheese industry, where well, it's not allowed to be called feta cheese anymore, salad, salad, uh, salad, or whatever we call them these days, this sort of thing, uh, Leo Postai, Blesk, all these sort of things, these all go, can, you know, I, I can tell you exactly why they ended up start, starting because of Danish agricultural history. And a really interesting thing illustrated by this nice poster I found uh, is that the probably, I haven't proven this yet, but probably the origins of what, I'm from England, what English people are very proud of, the English breakfast with bacon and eggs uh, is uh, very much to do with marketing from Denmark. So Denmark was exporting butter, bacon, and eggs for the English breakfast, and of course, encouraging people to eat more of this. So even some of the English culture has been uh, formed by these developments in Danish agriculture. You can see it's all sorts of types of industry. So Denmark, of course, is an extremely large medical industry, uh, very big in terms of providing insulin. This relates also to the way that you extracted insulin from animals before. So again, relating to the animal industry, the big shipping industry, well, a lot of this was founded at the time when Denmark had to be able to trade with the United Kingdom to export its agricultural goods. And even in terms of politics, the various different parties you have <coughs> in Denmark, so you have traditionally, you would, these are all based on developments within Danish society over time. So what was previously called the Hoyer party, the right party, the conservatives today, uh, these were against the Venstre party, 
with Hoya representing the old traditional land, uh, landed elites, the people I talked about a moment ago, Venstra uh, representing more the sort of peasant farmers. And then you had the Radicale Venstra who are representing these landless people, a lot of whom I just told you left for America. And then of course you get the Social Democrats emerging once uh, urbanization really uh, and industrialization starts to take off. And just to finish up, what about the future? Well, of course, I really hope that economic history continues to grow in strength. I think there's a lot of reason to suppose that it will do so. Uh, I think that economic historians have a lot to add uh, with considerable contemporary relevance uh, for today. My feeling is that we're going to go more and more in the di direction of using big data sets and particularly micro data, so data on individual firms or individual people uh, and this sort of thing. And uh, just to illustrate some of these things, I can tell you some examples of what I'm working on now. So I have one big project from DFF, which is about how conflict shaped Denmark. So people often think of Denmark as a very kind of homogeneous country with no conflicts, but that is not the case. There were big religious conflicts in the past uh, between various different religious factions. I want to show how these shaped both Danes in Denmark, but also Danes in the United States. And then I have another project which is using very detailed micro data from the cooperative creameries, uh, looking at various different questions, including issues of energy supply. So at certain points in history, uh, energy supplies have been disrupted. So for example, during the First World War, this makes it very difficult to run a butter factory. I want to look at the effect on productivity of this. And then I have some uh, a very sort of ambitious project, which is gradually raking in money from various uh, funding agencies right now on human capital and education. So it turns out that Denmark and Norway actually have rather impressive uh, data on grades and uh, information on biographies of all high school, high school graduates from the early, early 1800s until the Second World War. And we're basically busy digitizing all this stuff. This is really fascinating because it allows us to look in much more detail at the effects of, of education and also to look at other things to do with education. So one goal we have is to link uh, this data on education up to present day Danish register data so we can look at educational mobility over the very long run. So for example we might see that somebody who has a very high level of education in Denmark today maybe this is because their great 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 grandfather uh, happened to go to a very good school and have a high level of education back then. So this would be really fascinating to be able to look at. And then I should also mention a project uh, comparing Denmark and Russia with Yelena Kochmina, who's going to join us uh, soon at Hedge as a Marie Curie Fellow. Uh, this is a rather interesting uh, project where we're going to compare the economic history of Denmark and Russia. You might think, okay, that's really uh, kind of comparing David with Goliath somehow. Uh, but it turns out that there were all sorts of interesting connections between these uh, two countries. Basically, they, both countries hated Sweden historically, so they formed uh, alliances and were very active in transferring knowledge between them. You can see this in all sorts of ways. So, Look at the east of Russia. There's somewhere called the Bering Strait between Russia and, and Alaska. This is named after a Dane who helped the uh, Russians basically colonize the eastern part of the country. And this has caused actually a bit of attention in Russia because the Russian, as you can imagine, the Russian kind of nationalism is quite strong right now. Uh, and history plays a very big part in building uh, the idea of nationhood. And so the idea that you can compare Great Russia to little, little tiny Denmark has caused a bit of controversy, uh, which has also meant we'll get a bit of uh, attention there. Um, but of course, we'll try to be careful with exactly how we phrase it. And uh, really the, the point of this is to say that it's really important to bring Russia into European history. It's not as unique as historians have often considered it to be. Uh, we think it has an important role to play in terms of understanding wider European history as well. That's what I had to say. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, then you're very welcome to ask me now.